Good morning, Valley Life. Happy Sunday. We are so happy to see all these beautiful faces this morning. You're welcome. <laughs> Would you stand as we begin our worship service? Turn and greet someone around you this morning. Say hello. Good morning, Valley Life. Good morning. I know everyone loves each other, so sorry for interrupting that. But we want. 
Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Well, we'd like to welcome you this morning to Valley Life. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. We'd also like to welcome those who may be listening out in the parking lot and those who are tuning in to the service online. Special welcome to you. Uh, for anyone uh, that is with us this morning, if you're, if you're here for the first time or first time in a long time, we'd like to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. And so we have these communication cards, which are in the seat back in front of you. Uh, so if you could fill one of these out and drop them off at the welcome table, which is out in the foyer. Uh, Miss Andrea uh, is out there at that, at that welcome table, and uh, we have a special gift that we would like to give you uh, this morning. We also use this card for anyone uh, that is looking for uh, prayer requests or you want to just give a praise report. Uh, the elders will be praying throughout the week for you, so you can also use this card uh, to write those down, and you can place them in the offering boxes, which are at uh, the back of the, uh, uh, of the room here. All right. Um, so we are looking for three team leaders to help in the nursery during worship time. Uh, so if you are able and willing to serve, this is a once-a-month rotation. Uh, our little ones are needing to be held and rocked so that mom and dad uh, can come in and enjoy the worship service. Uh, please see if this is something that you're willing to serve, an area in which you're willing to serve. Please see Miss Don Joseph, and uh, she can give you more information uh, about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to sing this. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Did I do good? Yeah? Okay. Well, hey. <laughs> no. Hey, um, November. <laughs> my wife is giving me death eyes. Uh, November, November 1st at my house is when all of the Christmas decorations come out. November 1st. There's a big debate about this, but... That's what happens in my house. You know, Mariah Carey starts jumping off the top ropes, pummeling my, my eardrums. And so uh, that's what's going to be happening next weekend here at the church. So next weekend, Saturday at 9 a.m., please come and help decorate for Christmas. Uh, we welcome all helping hands, and uh, it's about an hour or two on Saturday morning, next Saturday morning, 9 a.m. All right. Uh, this year, we have Country Western Christmas is our adult Christmas party. Uh, it's Saturday, December 3rd at 6 p.m. We are having a barbecue competition. Uh, there's going to be prizes for the best country dressed. Uh, I'm sure Jason DeBee is going to win that, but you can try uh, to compete if you'd like to. Um, there's going to be a photo op, ornament exchange. Uh, this year we will not have the gift exchange, but we have something else special for you. So please sign up on our church app. Uh, we'd like to know how many will be attending. And we also want to know how many we can expect for our barbecue competition. All right. Uh, that's all I have for this morning. So church, would you pray with me? Father God, what a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that you have afforded us to come, to gather together, and to worship you. We think of our brothers and sisters uh, across the world who don't have that same freedom. Father, would you, would you be with them? Would you comfort them? Would you give them peace, Father? We thank you for just this season of thankfulness. Um, as believers, Lord, we know that we have much to be thankful for um, every year, every week, every day, Father. But Lord, we do thank you for this special season in which we take time to pause and reflect and put an extra special focus on thankfulness, Lord. 
As I said, there is so much to be thankful for, Lord, but we thank you, of course, for the gift of Jesus above all things. We thank you that he took our sin and our guilt and our shame and he nailed it to the cross and he placed his righteousness upon us and we are now called sons and daughters. So, Lord, we, we thank you so much for this. We thank you again for the time to be together. We thank you for... Uh, the many blessings that you provide to us as your people. Lord, we pray that you would be among us this morning as we continue to sing songs of praise to you. Would you be glorified above all this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. Would you stand with us once again as we continue to worship?
gracious we don't deserve to be here but Lord because of your love because of your great mercy your great grace we're here this morning Lord freely singing and praising your name 
We ask that you would just continue to point our hearts and our affections towards you, Lord. That this morning our focus would be on you, God, not on ourselves, not our plans later this day, Jesus, but that we would just be drawn into your presence right now. That you would just speak through your servant this morning. Help us to learn and understand from your word. And we thank you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sunday to you. My name is Vinny. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Valley Life Community Church. And it's a great pleasure and blessing to welcome you all this morning. If you have your Bible, you can open it up to Acts chapter 19 or turn it on and scroll to Acts chapter 19. Uh, And while you do that, I'm going to invite our preschoolers through fifth graders to stand up and make their way toward the back double doors to Miss Dawn and the awaiting leaders and helpers. We're going to have a great Sunday discipling you and having a good time. And while our kids make their way out, uh, last Sunday, I told you that next Sunday, November 27th, uh, we're going to be doing a testimony and thanksgiving service, and I was looking for four people who'd be willing to share a story of something that they're great for in what God has been doing in and around their life. I had three people come and commit to do that. I'm looking for one more. And so if you like to wait till the last minute to do things, this is your opportunity to live into that. Uh, and so if you want to share a testimony next Sunday, would you come see me today? Uh, and we'll talk about how that, what that's going to look like and when to do it. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Psalm 107.22 says, let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. That's our goal next Sunday, is just to celebrate the things that God is doing uh, in and around us this last year. All right, Uh, we are in our series in Acts called Conflict with Culture. Uh, Three years ago, we started the book of Acts, and I told you we were going to take four years to get it done. We would divide it up into four sections. This is the third section, and our hopes as we've entered into this third part of Acts is that we would be confronted with the gospel, that we would live courageously for Christ, that we would share the gospel with boldness, trusting God with the results and that we would live lives that would impact those around us and our neighbors, whomever they might be. That is, if the church closed tomorrow, would the Treasure Valley miss us? If you moved out of your neighborhood, who knew you, would be a, you were a Christian? Uh, if you quit your job, would your coworkers know that you had a love for Jesus and the gospel? Our hope is we've examined the gospel, press forward out into uh, the ends of the earth and seeing it impact and come into conflict with both religious and rebellious hearts is that we ourselves will be confronted by that great truth, our need to be fully sold out for Jesus at all places, with all people, at all times. Amen? Amen. Today's the final message in this series. I hope uh, it's been an encouragement to you. Next week, as I said, we'll do the Thanksgiving service, and then the week after that, we start Advent already, if you can believe it. All right, Acts chapter 19, we're going to pick up at verse 21. So if you've got your Bible open or on, if you would stand with me for the reading of the word. Uh, This is something we do each and every week, not out of ceremony or tradition, though we certainly could, but we do it out of reverence for the word of God, believing that it is what has the power in the room to change our mind, to convict our heart, and to ultimately transform our life. So with a clear mind and a willing heart, would you hear the word of the Lord, beginning in Acts chapter 19, verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! 
So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the whole assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when the crowd recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought, not to, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can, justify to this, that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord, church. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it tells the story of your people from beginning to end and your plan to redeem them through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help me to deliver it to your people carefully and clearly today. That you would, God, help us as a church to be a long-term disciple-making presence in the Treasure Valley that you would be glorified by that presence and that people's lives would be transformed, that you would help us to be dedicated to the word and empowered by the Holy Spirit as your people. We ask this for your glory and our good through Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So again, for bonus Bible points, what is the name of the city that Paul is in currently? Ephesus. Again, no hard questions in this room, all easy stuff. Okay, he's in Ephesus. Well, let me, I did a little bit of this last week, but let me just kind of review what kind of city Ephesus, Ephesus is. It is one of the most important cities, if not the most important city, in the Roman province of Asia. It's a metropolitan city where people from all over the empire would come and live there, and it's located in what we would say is modern day Turkey. Uh, it held the reputation for being the guardian city for the temple of Artemis, or as the Romans would call her, Diana. The temple of Diana, or Artemis, as she's referred to here in Acts 19, was the mother of the gods. She was considered one of the se- her temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and worship of Diana, or Artemis, was associated with youth, fertility, and life. Its centerpiece was a meteorite that fell from the heavens and had been carved into the image of a woman. A major economic section of the city was dedicated to the worship of Artemis, And they would create and sell idols and replicas of her temple, which worshipers who had traveled there would take home like trinkets, and others would take and bring to the temple as an act of offering and sacrifice. The temple priests would then take many of these silver idols or replicas of the temple, and they would melt them down and then use them as hard currency. And so this economic system and cycle would go. People would worship Artemis with silver, the priests would melt it down and use it hard currency, and then it would turn over and over and over. The theater mentioned here in verse 35 uh, would probably be a stadium in our language, something uh, like uh, Arco Arena uh, here. Uh, It seated about 24,000 people and held uh, in three tiers, and sporting events, civic gatherings, and other events would happen in that place. Uh, Paul's ministry in Ephesus started with an early brief stop where he visited the synagogue but wasn't there very long. In fact, in chapter 18, verse 19, we're told that the people in the synagogue wanted Paul to stay there, uh, but he had to continue traveling to preach the gospel and plant churches. Paul returns to Ephesus after Apollos had preached there, and he had a successful public preaching and teaching ministry for two years in the hall of Tyrannus at this point in the story. This leads Luke to write this summary statement at the end of those two years in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, when he says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. So in Ephesus and in that region of Asia Minor, because of Paul's faithful testimony to Jesus and the gospel, the word of God was spreading. So that means it was getting to more people in more places, but it was also prevailing. That means it was having an effective work in the lives of people. 
The gospel was changing things. And we read some of that last week when people were taking the magic books and, and some of the artifacts of their former ways of life and idol worship and throwing them into the fire. Luke has used this phrase and something like it previously to summarize big major transition moments in the book of Acts. So if Luke, uh, or excuse me, if Acts 19.20 sounds familiar, that's because it is. In fact, this is the way we've divided up the book of Acts over these first three sections is according to Luke's summary statements. So if you remember in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, we can read this verse. So the word of God spread, the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. And then again, Luke will summarize things in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. And then again in Acts 12, 24, Luke will summarize events this way. But the word of God spread and multiplied. And then again, just a few chapters ago in chapter 16, verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You see, what Luke is doing is he's showing out that what Jesus said would happen in Acts chapter 1, 8, the disciples were going to be his witnesses in Judea and Samaria, excuse me, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, is happening And so Luke is laying out all of these geographical steps with these summary statements. The gospel is expanding all the way out here to Asia Minor, and it's all associated with the centrality of the word, that is the testimony of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection at the center, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Faithful gospel preaching, and then the Holy Spirit taking that faithful gospel preaching and teaching and multiplying it out into the lives of people. This produced a long-term disciple-making presence. It's what our desire is as a church, is that we would have a long-term disciple-making presence. God has been faithful already to use gospel preaching and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to produce one generation at Valley Life. Okay? Church was planted in the mid-90s. We're in 2022, and the church is still here. Okay, one whole generation, a faithful, long-term, disciple-making presence. But I want a multi-generational presence, amen? I want my grandkids to say that grandpa preached at that church that's still there in Meridian, Idaho. If we're to get there, we must see what Luke does here with the centrality of the word and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as the foundation of the church. Nothing else can be the foundation of who we are. It must be the testimony of Jesus his life, death, and resurrection, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit if we're going to achieve this. Our part is to keep the gospel at the center and to trust God to do his part. Jesus is the one who builds churches. If he wants a church here, it will be here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's my main idea if you want to take notes today as we make our way into the text. Uh, Disciples of Jesus boldly exalt Christ in cities filled with idols. Disciples of Jesus boldly exalt, that is to lift up Christ, in cities filled with idols. What do we have here is last week's sermon and this week's sermon colliding into two parts. The effective preaching and teaching ministry of Paul, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, radical repentance among the people, and the results in the city of people worshiping Jesus. So let's pick up verse 21. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, that's Corinth, And go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Luke is pretty good at giving us Paul's travel itinerary. And so that's what he's doing here. He's telling us after these events. Well, what are the events that afterward Paul is thinking about leaving Ephesus? Well, it's it's the radical repentance and revival and renewal of the people that we saw last week where their lives were living as committed Christians to Christ. The community was changing. The gospel was impacting lives. The church was alive and healthy. And so because Paul was a serial church planter, because he was a man who took the gospel to new places, he thought, okay, the work is bearing fruit here. It's time for me to move on. It's time for me to move on and take the gospel to new places and to strengthen the places in which I've already been. And so that's his plan. He plans to travel back to Jerusalem, probably to give a report of the Gentiles who were being converted And he wants to go to Rome. And he's going to travel there by Macedonia and Corinth first. So he's got stops where he's going to plant churches and where he's going to encourage churches. He sends off two of his helpers. Timothy, uh, who was a third generation Christian after his mother and grandmother. 
Paul was Timothy's spiritual father. That is, he's the one who probably led him to Christ. And he refers to him often as my true child in the faith. And so this is someone that Paul both loves and has great affection for and leadership investment into. So he sends him out, and then Erastus uh, accompanies Timothy. Erastus is mentioned three times in the New Testament, all associated with the city of Corinth. In fact, we're told that he's the church, or excuse me, not the church, the city treasurer for Corinth. So this is someone who's been impacted by the gospel as a giant doll, has come to faith, and has continued to help Paul in ministry. And so he's going to travel back to Macedonia, most likely back to Corinth to be with the church there. He sends two of his ministers ahead of him to start the plans and start the work, and then we're told that he's going to stay in Asia for a little while longer. In Acts chapter 20, so next fall, we'll hear that Paul will spend a total of three years in Ephesus. Two years preaching and teaching, and then this last year ministering. Verse 23. About that time, so about what time? About the time Paul sent off Timothy and Erastus and planned to travel. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. You know what no little disturbance means? It means it was a big disturbance. It means it was a big deal. It means it was a big deal. It means it was, the gospel, the way, as it was called at this point in history, or Christianity, was causing such a problem in the city that everyone was beginning to function, and, or everybody was beginning to take notice. What does it mean that it's causing a disturbance? It means that people living the lifestyle of following Jesus were interfering with the normal arrangement and functioning of the city. I love that definition. Think about that. That just because people were living faithfully to Jesus, the city could no longer function and uh, arrange itself normally the way it would. You remember from last week, worship of magic and dark spirituality and demonic activity was the centerpiece in Ephesus. And because people were faithfully living, discipling lives in Jesus, the city was disturbed. It couldn't function. It couldn't arrange itself normally the way it wanted to. Verse 24. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen, these he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but, almost, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. This is the impact of the gospel. So it wasn't just Ephesus. That's probably the centerpiece. But as the gospel is radiated out into Asia, more and more people are hearing this and they're converting to Jesus and leaving the worship of Artemis. This disturbance is rooted in the fact that Demetrius and the other tradesmen, who is a silversmith, are essentially losing money. What was his chief complaint? He's not concerned with doctrine. Our God's better than their God. He's concerned with dollars. <laughs> that the worship of these Christians are taking money out of my pocket. So he gathers the other tradesmen and craftsmen together and he says, listen, from this business, what is that business? The business of idolatry. They profited from the religious enslavement of people to false gods. They contributed to the idolatry of the human heart and it was big business for them. They, they'd grown wealthy from this and so Paul's ministry and testimony to the lordship and identity of Jesus had begun to impact the economics of the city. Why? Because people were beginning to recognize that gods made with hands were not gods. And when you're in the little g God-making business and people recognize the futility of those little g gods, guess what they, they do? They stop going to the store. They no longer, in Ephesus, found their identity, security, and comfort in the worship of Artemis. They no longer found their identity, security, or comfort in the worship of Artemis. That's what a little g-god is, or an idol is. It's anything that we choose to find our identity, security, and comfort in. So the definition of an idol or a god made with hands is this. Anything we choose to find our identity, security, or comfort in other than Jesus Christ. It's anything we choose to find our identity, security, or comfort in other than Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this idol worship in, in these three areas. In terms of identity, this is who you understand yourself to be. 
As human beings, we have this quest to understand who am I and how do I understand the world around me. It's called a, a worldview. And it begins with understanding who you are. As if we're human beings, we can choose to identify our own personal identity in a variety of ways. The trouble with, with that is if we start with anything other than God to determine our identity, that thing will ultimately fail us. It will create an idol of identity. It will never be satisfied, and that means it will continually demand more and more and more of you, and it will always fail you. There is only one person who will never fail you if you choose to find your identity in him, and that is in Jesus Christ. Consider, if you will, how many people choose to understand their identity according to their relationship status. The core of who they are as single or married and either taking great pride in that or great despair in that, depending on the quality of your marriage or single life. The problem with taking your identity from your relationship status is that marriages end, sometimes in disaster and divorce, but at the very least they will end in death. And so what happens when your spouse dies and you've rooted your identity, who you are in your marriage? You're not just enduring the death of your loved one and your spouse, maybe the mother or father of your children, but now you've got on top of that an identity crisis. Who am I if I'm not my spouse's spouse? For other human beings, they choose to identify themselves according to their career. Guilty, by the way. Suffered through that in 2017. I shared that story a few weeks ago. When I got mixed up, the idea that pastoring is not something that I do, but it's something that I am. And then for a season, I was no longer a pastor or I had to think about not being a pastor. It was awful. Did I have any worth or value to God anymore? Who was I? For many people, when they choose to identify themselves according to their career, it'll work for a little while. The problem is what happens when you're fired or you retire what happens when your job comes to an end? A ton of Twitter and Facebook employees wrestling through this right now. What about if I choose to find my identity in recreation, something that's fun? How many of us are sports fans? Come on, come on, right? This is probably the easiest one to pick on because sports fans have entire stadiums built to the worship of their team. Tens of thousands of people gather this very morning wearing their team colors, painting their faces, chanting their team's names, right? The old joke, 50,000 people who need exercise are watching 22 men who desperately need rest. <laughs> What's the problem with this? I tell you the problem. The problem is the Oakland Raiders. Let me, re well, let, me pick, let me just pick on you. No judgment. Okay, I understand. But listen, the Oakland Raiders, who were for a time the Los Angeles Raiders, who were then the Oakland Raiders, and are now who? The Vegas Raiders. What are you going to do? If your team up and leaves your city, when you've given your time, your money, your energy, your vocal cords for championing them, and then they pick up and move on you? No wonder there's so much vitriol and hate when teams leave cities. Because you've invested, right? Maybe you find an affinity group. Maybe there are people that you like to do the same thing as you, and so you, you belong to that affinity group. Your mutual affection gives you an identity for this thing. What happens when you can no longer do that thing? What happens if the group disbands? See, everything that we choose to set up as our identity that is not rooted in who God created us to be as image bearers and then who God has redeemed us to be, the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, being renewed in true righteousness and holiness will fail you and it will leave you with an identity crisis. The only identity that will not fail you is that of child of God that you inherit through faith in Jesus Christ. How about security? What about that thing that you find peace of mind in? An idol can become that thing that gives us peace of mind. 
Again, maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your bank account balance. Maybe your retirement retirement account eight months ago gave you security. You thought your future was secure. And now, not so much. I heard one great analyst speak of it this way. He said the stock market will go up and down. And overall, it's, it's like a yo-yo going upstairs. So there is a future where we believe semi-confidently that it will improve. But that doesn't help the people who need to retire today. Because their retirement value isn't determined by number of dollars anymore. It's determined by number of years they continue to work. Consider the people who've moved to the Treasure Valley looking for the golden dream of retirement in Idaho who are now saying welcome to Walmart. Why? Because that which they had their security in has failed them. And so their peace of mind is gone. What about your, again, your housing, your social status, whatever you might find your security in, that thing will fail you. Because it is not a firm foundation. The only firm foundation we have is the everlasting creator of the universe, God himself. Or what about comfort? When you go through the identity crisis, when your security has failed you, what do you then go and seek comfort in? Where do you find your highest joy? As a parent, maybe it's your kids. You know the trouble with that is? They will defy you, they will disobey you, and eventually they will move out. Whatever you find your highest joy in, in times of pain, And grief and sorrow is what you find your comfort in. And so for many human beings, they turn to substance abuse to find their comfort. This can be alcohol, this can be drugs, this can be food, this can be sex. They choose to find something to comfort their soul in when they're in moments of turmoil. For those living in Ephesus, they chose to find their identity, their security, and their comfort in the worship of Artemis. And what Paul did was he exposed that, that when they would seek their identity, security, and comfort in Artemis, that she would fail them because she was a God made with hands. And God's made with hands, as Demetrius so eloquently summarizes it, God's made with hands are not God's. And this radical truth was taking root in the hearts and the lives of the people, so much so that it was beginning to economically impact the city of Ephesus because the people were coming to understand that Christ determines who you are, an image bearer of God renewed in the likeness of Christ, that Christ determines your security, that though this world may crumble and fall and devolve into chaos, your eternal destiny remains secure in Christ alone. That Christ is your comfort, for he is our great high priest who knows and has been tempted in every way that we are, with one vital exception, without sin, so that we can turn to him in times of pain, sorrow, and grief, and find everlasting joy because he understands what we're enduring and he conquered it. This conviction was taking root in the lives of the citizens of Asia, and in particular Ephesus, and it began to impact Demetrius' identity, his security, and his comfort. And so what did he do? He got mad. He got angry because his idols were being threatened. Who was he if he was not an idol maker of Artemis? What security did he have if his wealth dried up? What comfort could he find in the worship of an empty temple? Verse 27, Demetrius continues his argument against the way. He says, there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificence. She whom all Asia and the world worship. The outcomes of idol worship when there's a long-term disciple-making presence taking root in a community is threefold. Number one, the reputation of those who contribute to idolatry are discredited. That's what's going on here. The trade of making idols for Artemis was coming under disrepute. Oh, you make those little things that people think bless them? Number two, The locations for the practice of idolatry are abandoned and left empty. And number three, the idols themselves are demolished and despised. That's what Demetrius says is happening or is in danger of happening. 
that their job or their trade of making idols would become under disrepute, that the temple of Artemis may be counted as nothing, just an empty shell, and three, that the goddess herself would be demolished and despised. There could be no greater answer to Paul's ministry prayers than these three things. There could be no greater answer to our prayer than that for the Treasure Valley. That those who would find profit and gain from enslaving people spiritually into things that cannot provide identity, comfort, and security for them, that that, rep- that, their, that job, that position in the city would come under disrepute. That people would get out of the human trafficking business because it's under disrepute. That people would get out of the substance abuse business because it's under disrepute. Because people no longer found their comfort, security, or identity in those things. That the places people go to practice idolatry stood as empty shells and condemned buildings. And that the Treasure Valley itself would recognize the idols they worship and they would begin to demolish and despise them. Could we imagine the Treasure Valley in 20 years after a long-term disciple-making presence here? What buildings do we want closed? What jobs do we want left open? And what idols would we want smashed? Verse 28. When they heard this, so these are the craftsmen, the the blue-collar guys, they hear Demetrius' argument. They were enraged. This is what we can expect from the world. Because when you show a fool his foolishness, he doesn't go in wisdom, he gets mad. (laughs) When they heard this, they were enraged and they were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, so that the city was filled with confusion and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, those are the elected officials, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the city. So these tradesmen, they get mad because their livelihood, their idolatry, their business is being threatened. And so they begin to cry out this phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Do you know that saying something loud enough and often enough does not make it true? That on a clear, sunny, blue day, we could get up, go right through these double doors, and I begin to cry out that the sky is purple. And I could proclaim it loudly and repeatedly, but you could look at me and say, that's just, that's just not true. That's just not true. Hearing that Artemis is threatened by the truth of the gospel, these tradesmen begin crying out this phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. But even though they're going to repeat it, and even they're going to say it loud, it doesn't make it true. What it can do is cause confusion and chaos among people. And we see that happen here in Ephesus. So that they all rush into the theater, that 24,000 seat stadium in our language. And again, before we turn our noses down upon them, we're no better. Culturally, this is still the way human beings live. We create chants of things that are untrue and if People believe if they say them long enough and loud enough, but all they really end up is with a confused and chaotic culture. Think about this one. Uh, Speech or silence is violence. Listen, I'm not saying words can't hurt, and I'm not saying that words can't do emotional damage, but words are not physical violence. Okay? Me saying something is not a physical assault upon you. We talked about the implications in uh, the Belgian Confession study this morning of uh, if you were to slap someone, that's different than to speak words to them. Okay, it's just not true. Here's another one. Abortion is health care. Something that people say loud enough and long enough, but as long as you say it loud enough and long enough, it will not be true but it will cause chaos and confusion. And it will create a false dichotomy. 
if Artemis of the Ephesians is great, then Jesus must not be great. So Demetrius gathers up these men. They begin shouting this phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They drag two of the Christians that they could get their hands on into there. And the whole city is thrown into chaos and confusion. Um, what does Paul want to do? Look at verse 30. What does Paul want to do? Again, no hard questions in here. Answers in the text. Paul wanted to go in there. Paul wanted to go in there. This whole city is thrown into chaos and confusion. They seize two Christians and drag them in there. They continue to loudly scream and worship, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And what does Paul want to do? He wants to get them all up in there. Kevin DeYoung defines boldness for Jesus this way. He says, true boldness in Christ champions the truth and walks in the truth no matter if everyone or anyone at all hates that truth, loves that truth, or something in between. Paul lived with boldness for Christ because he committed himself to the truth of the gospel and was willing to walk obediently in it no matter if everyone or anyone believed him. Verse 32. Now some from the crowd, or some, excuse me, sound, some cried out one thing, some another for the assembly that was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander whom the Jews had put forward and Alexander motioning with his hand wanted to make a defense to the crowd and but when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Alexander's probably put forth as a political maneuver. The Jews want to distance themselves from this Christianity that's caused this commotion. But the crowd recognizes that he's simply from another faith community that would deny their belief in the greatness of Artemis, and so they just shout him down too. Paul would later describe this season of ministry in Ephesus this way. In 1 Corinthians 16, he says this, "'But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost,' Because a wide door for effective ministry has opened for me, yet many oppose me. And what many Bible commentators believe is a reference to this particular riot. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, Paul will say, If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do to me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That whole section is speaking of the necessity and validity of the resurrection of Christ. And what Paul is saying is, listen, if I was willing to walk into a stadium full of beasts for Christ, just as a mere man, what good did that do to me? But I could walk in there because Christ is raised from the dead. Verse 35. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, yea, for clerks... When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is here who does not know that the city of Ephesians is a temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. You know what that tells me? That the Christians were not preaching against Artemis, but they were preaching for Christ. They didn't get tangled up in the cultural idols of the time. They preached the supremacy and effectiveness of Jesus Christ. They preached Jesus as supreme, and they trusted God to take care of the cultural things. Verse 37, For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If, there Demetri if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, that is not this chaotic riot. Verse 40, For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed 
the assembly. The clerk's argument basically comes down to twofold. Number one, that the worship of Artemis is secure in Ephesians. Essentially that no earthly movement could threaten their goddess who fell from the sky. Number two, that the Christians they had seized had committed no crime. They preached Jesus. And then number three, if the Ephesians were in danger of being charged with rioting, that is, they were breaking their own laws. And then number four, he offers legal counsel that if the silversmiths and the tradesmiths are really that upset, they can bring a legal charge and don't need to resort to violence. These arguments subside the crowd's anger and confusion, and they are dismissed. And then in chapter 20, verse 1, we read this. After the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and after saying farewell, departed to go to Macedonia. And chapter 19 ends where the middle began, with Paul traveling to plant churches and continue his gospel ministry of boldness, to continue to move on to the next city and proclaim Christ in the midst of a city that worshiped idols. If we're going to exalt Christ in the midst of a city full of idols, there are two things we must believe and the one thing we must do as people. Number one, we must believe that we are lost without Christ, that our sin has separated us from God and from one another, and that if we remain in our sin, we remain under the judgment of the wrath of God. That's the first thing we must come to terms with. Number two, we must believe that we are saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, that he alone is the great one. That Jesus, through his obedient life, substitutionary death, and glory-filled resurrection is the good news of salvation for all who will believe. If we will believe these two things, the final thing we must do, this is Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him with identity, security, and comfort. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for Paul's boldness. We thank you for Luke's pen and parchment that have preserved this word for us. And so God, we ask that you would help us to identify the places where we find false identity, false comfort, and false security in things of this earth, in gods that are not gods, that you give us the gift of repentance by your spirit, that we would identify ourselves with Jesus alone, that we would find our security in Christ alone, And then in times of pain and grief and sorrow and temptation, we would find our comfort in Christ alone. Help us, we pray, to be a long-term disciple-making presence in the Treasure Valley, we ask through Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward to lead us in song. Um, If God is getting your attention with something, uh, either maybe today in the message or just this week or just recently, uh, we'd love the opportunity to pray with you and for you. Uh, Today, after service, just here to my right on the floor in front of our uh, food drive, we'll have leaders on our prayer team that are ready and able to pray for you and with you. Um, And just before we move into worship, would you take a look at the food drive, by the way? Man, you guys are killing it. Uh, Our goal is to raise 2,000 pounds of food for the Boise Rescue Mission. I had the opportunity to be with some of their leaders on Thursday uh, outside of the Nampa uh, Walmart. it's a huge deal. They were going to feed 1,500 families over the weekend and another 1,000 uh, this coming week. And so um, what we're going to do with all that food is help replenish their pantry uh, in the new year uh, when they get done with all their holiday food. So if you would, please consider donating. Uh, for now, would you stand with me and let's worship our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen?
chapter 19, verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. May that be our prayer request. That God, you would use your gospel to increase and to prevail here in the valley. Father, we thank you for today. We ask that you would be glorified and that you would help us to carry out the good news of Jesus Christ from this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Uh, out there in the lobby, we have Gideon's International Ministry uh, putting the word in places where it is not. Please stop by the table and say hi and greet them and get connected. Deal.